through the whole process. So we uh, applied for the job, telephone interview with me, in-office interview for two hours with me, with Gary, I mean, we'll tell him exactly what the job is. He comes in for the, for the shadow day, does the, does the shadow, sends him out to lunch, we give him the training, he sits down at the phone, He's there for about 10 minutes, and Gary or I, and I are in his office chatting, and I see his head pop through the window, and he just goes. He gets up, and we never saw him again. <laughs> and it was, it, so that's incredibly telling. People think they can do this job, but the moment that you put a list in front of and say, t call up a stranger and ask him how their career is, it's, it scares the crap out of them. So that's, uh, but to answer your question, yes, we get our team involved heavily, and they, they have a say. They absolutely have a say. Well, thank you guys. We are actually, we're out of time. Uh, but thank you. Will you please join me in thanking these guys for their. Come on, all right. Yes, definitely. Good morning, everyone. I gotta tell you, how about all of you? Does the energy just feel different getting some of these next gens up here, hearing from them? Uh, I just love hearing from all of them. So, um, so thank you all for that. And Annette, as always, wonderful job facilitating. She's just like the rock star, one of my many rock stars on my team. So I have a question for all of you before we start the next session. How many of you blog? How many of you blog? Uh, only two or three. So lesson learned, you need to blog because this next speaker, the reason he's here is I read his blog and I'm like, oh my goodness, this guy speaks to everything that I'm trying to get across to the network. Number one, and we'll talk about his formal background in a minute, but he's a salesperson. He's in executive, he's in search business. He knows how to change people's behavior, how real change happens. And it connected, and I'm like, I need the network to hear this. I've talked to many of you over the last day about training. So what I need you all to get in your mind is it's not just about training. It's how do we truly change the behavior of the individuals that are on our teams. I could not have set this up more perfectly. I've got to tell you, I did not coach any of them, but boy, did Lauren knock it out of the park with some of the things that I'm going to be reinforcing after Dan's session. So listen closely to what Dan said. Keep in mind what the panel said here. And when Dan is done today, I'm going to talk a little bit about our new core training, which core training is our new AE training, and you're going to hear how we need a partnership between us training and corporate and all of you to really make a change in the behavior and the performance of your individuals. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce Dan. So Dan Fisher is the founder and owner of Menemsha Group, a provider of sales and enablement solutions, including sales training, onboarding, coaching, and analytics for IT staffing firms. Menemsha Group helps staffing firms accelerate time to quota attainment for new hires and improve their sales effectiveness by accelerating the sales cycle, improving sales win results, and increasing overall quota attainment. Dan has personally consulted with over 400 staffing and recruiting companies and is trained and couched coach thousands of sales reps, recruiters, and staffing industries across the country. I do want to take a real quick moment and tell you how Dan came to us besides the blog, was he's done work for Edgerock, which is one of the sister companies in CDI, and has had phenomenal results with them. So also a good kudos for him. In 2000, um, prior to launching Menemsha in 2008, Dan spent 17 years in the IT staffing and services industry, selling and leading regional and na national sales teams. Dan is responsible for the day-to-day -day leadership of Menemsha Group and is instrumental in the successful transition of the company from a founder-driven services-only business to a SaaS-based sales enablement company. Dan is a popular speaker at industry events, TechServe Alliance, Bullhorn Engage, and Staffing World, as well as sales conferences and leadership, result, leadership retreats. Please give a warm welcome to Dan Fisher. Good morning, everybody. How you guys doing? You guys have a good time last night? 
Good, good, good. Well, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, not only am I thrilled to be here, but I'm thrilled about the topic we're going to talk about uh, this morning. I am really, really passionate about it, so being the catalyst for retention. So we're not going to just talk about being the catalyst for retention in terms of retaining your employees, but more specifically, ensuring that they retain the skills, the knowledge, and the behaviors that you teach them. So not only for your existing employees, but also for your new employees who, uh, who you hire and go through, uh, through the onboarding process. Um, so when learners go through or when we put employees through training, we know their role. Their role is real simple. You know, you give them the training, they consume the training, but often what tends to get lost in the shuffle is what does the manager do? And what is the role that the manager plays or the leader plays uh, in developing that employee and having them, him or her go through the training program? So uh, without further ado, Let's, uh, let me try to paint a picture here real quickly, a fictional picture, if you will. So let's pretend that we're all part of you know, XYZ staffing and, and search firm. And collectively as a group, we make up the executive leadership team. And we've decided that we're going to launch a sales improvement initiative or a recruiting improvement initiative. And so we want to we wanna really up the level of effectiveness of our sales team and our recruiters. And so. The good news is, is we're flush with cash. So we've got all kinds of money, and we've been able to invest and create a world-class strategy. Uh, so in fact, our strategy is so good, we went out, we hired McKinsey, we hired Bain and Company. They came in, we asked them to poke holes in our strategy, and they said, guys, this is the best strategy we've ever seen. After that, we said, you know what? Let's build world-class content. So we went out as a leadership team, and we hired the best instructional designers. PhDs in instructional design, and they created the best content money can buy. So we're using uh, micro-learning, video-based training. We've got it set up to run on our employees' mobile device. We're going to have uh, really compelling content. We're going to use gamification, asynchronous learning, all the bells and whistles that are best practices in, in training today. So world-class content. And then the third component is we've also come up with a high-impact training program. So again, we're going to use blended learning, where our employees are going to go through online training as well as workshop or instructor-led training. And so the question really becomes, is that going to put us in position and ensure that we're going to have lasting results? That's the million-dollar question. Anybody want to take a guess what the answer is? You probably can guess based on where I'm sort of leading this. So, Here's the thing with training, and any time you bring a new employee on board, <clears throat> training is the launch of a change management initiative. So any time you put an employee through training or bring on a new employee, you're effectively asking them to adopt new skills, new behaviors, adopt knowledge, and to one degree or another, you're asking that employee to change how they've currently done things. Uh, if it's a brand new employee, somebody right out of college, you know, brand new to sales, brand new to the search industry, then they don't necessarily have bad habits to break, but it's certainly going to be new knowledge. But here's the thing. So, you know, Sherry, in my introduction, mentioned I've worked with over 400 different staffing firms across the country. I would tell you 98% of them make this one common mistake. Everybody gets real excited about the launch phase. So they come up with the strategy, they come up with the design, they map out their onboarding program or their training program, and then on the calendar, they got it circled like it's a big game, you know, coming up. Here's our launch date for the training. And then on the calendar, they also have the date that the training's going to end. And everybody's all pumped over that. And so the, the, the problem or the mistake that's made is there is a huge overemphasis on the launch of the training and a significant underemphasis on the sustain phase. And so the sustain phase is essentially all the tasks and activities and events that need, to be ha that need to happen and need to be facilitated by us as leaders after the training has completed or has concluded. So really, really important. And that's really the difference. The slide up here kind of illustrating you know, you reach a fork in the road. So those who focus on sustain and have a plan to sustain the change are going to have success. Those who don't usually end up with, um, uh, you know, negative ROI. So let's talk just briefly about change management. I'm not going to dive into a ton of detail here. 
So change management. Anybody, do you guys, are we familiar with change management or anybody have experience with change management or leading change in an organization? Okay, so when I, when I ran a branch and ran operations, I sure as heck didn't know anything about it and then until I got more experience and got promoted and so forth. So change management is the practice of driving business results, improving business results by asking people to change behaviors. And change management itself as a practice is the practice of mitigating the resistance to that change. So think about it. Anytime if you were to roll out a new CRM or ATS tool, you're going to have new process for how you enter candidates, enter contacts, the workflow for submitting candidates. And most likely, there's going to be changes in the workflow with the new system versus the old system. So you're now asking your people to change the way they work. So change management is all about how you go about managing the resistance to implementing that change or that idea. And there's basically three components to change management. The first thing is we got to have a plan for the change. So we have to understand exactly what the change is that we're asking of people. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Then when we implement the change, we got to have a plan for how we're going to implement it, how we're going to actually operationalize it. And then, of course, the third component up there is a plan to sustain the change. And again, we're going to spend some more time talking about that, and I'm going to share with you some ideas and best practices on the role that you guys all can play as leaders to ensure that the change is sustained. Uh, the diagram that you see up here on the other side of the slide, uh, McKinsey and Company, a couple years ago, they did a big study on change management. They've done a lot of them, being a big management consulting company. And the first one up here says, so it says four factors for change outcomes, basically four key success factors. So the first one says organizational-wide ownership and commitment to the changes across all levels of the organization. So let me just kind of translate that. Basically what that means is if the CEO is not totally bought in and committed and the frontline managers aren't totally bought in and committed, whatever it is you're rolling out, training, a new process, a new system, it's going to fail. And I can, you know, with confidence, stand up here on this stage in front of all of you and I, can, and I can share with you. I mean, I've worked with hundreds of companies where I've seen this happen and, and inevitably it fails every single time. So everybody has to be fully bought in and totally on board. And I'll talk a little bit more about exactly what that means and what that means for you as owners from a commitment standpoint. The second one says, ability to focus an organization on a prioritized set of changes. So let me try to translate that. Let's suppose hypothetically that, you know, in our office we've decided, you know, wow, our, our fill rate has gone down over the last few months. And we're, you know, kind of scratching our head thinking, gee, well, what do we need to get our fill rate up? Before we can implement, quote unquote, a new process for how we qualify jobs or maybe how we qualify candidates to improve our fill rate, we as leaders need to first really get under the covers and peel back the onion and really understand how our how our, um, our associates, our account executives, how they're actually going about currently qualifying job orders and currently qualifying candidates before we implement the new process or methodology so that we can recognize the exact degree of change that we're asking of the employee. Because if we don't understand to what degree we're asking them to change, we're not going to be able to come up with a good change management plan, let alone understand what it is that we as leaders have to commit to to support our employee in driving that change and driving adoption of the skill and the behavior. So really, really important. So how many of you are currently tracking and measuring the effectiveness of your training and onboarding program. So if you were to go hire somebody tomorrow and put him or her through training, anybody tracking the effectiveness of your, your training and onboarding? So nobody, okay. So um, the good news is, the good news is you're not alone. You know, a lot of, a lot of companies kind of struggle with that, maybe not sure what metrics to track or measure. And uh, fortunately, I've got a couple of ideas that I'm gonna share with you. So the effectiveness of any training program Again, and when I say training and onboarding, whether it's training existing employees or onboarding new hires, um, you're going to want to track and measure the degree of knowledge transfer. You're going to want to track and measure the application of the skills. And of course, we're going to want to track and measure the adoption of the behaviors. And so let me talk about knowledge transfer for a second. So essentially what knowledge transfer is referring to is 
That's, that goes back to the quality of your content and how dynamic and rich it is. So for example, there's a number of studies out there uh, that show that you know, having, a can I'm sorry, having a, uh, an employee go through training and just reading a static document, a Word document, a PowerPoint document, has a very low adoption rate and very low knowledge transfer rate. Whereas if they go through blended learning where it's instructor-led, maybe they watch some interactive videos and they do a combination of exercises, that's going to have a much more higher adoption and knowledge transfer rate. Uh, knowledge transfer also ties back to the frequency and the quality of the coaching that the individual receives from him, his or her leader or manager. And I'm going to talk in a few minutes about what good coaching looks like. So that's knowledge transfer. Second one, application of skills and adoption of behaviors. And I'll put those two just kind of together. So, you know, if you can't track and measure um, application of skills or adoption of behaviors, then there's really no point in putting, putting somebody through training. That's the whole point, is to get them to adopt the new skills and behaviors. And so there are some ways, there are some mechanisms that you can use and adopt to actually uh, track that. And I'll give you, a, I'll share a quick story and then I'll give you an example. So uh, a few years ago, I actually had a, a customer of mine out of, um, uh, well, we'll just say the Southeast, who uh, they invited me, well, first they called me up and they said, Dan, we'd like to have you come in and do a two-day workshop and we want to focus on, quote, unquote, consultative selling. I said, okay, great. So we, you know, over the course of the month, we went through conversations to talk about what, they, what that meant, what, what that was going to look like. And so we got it mapped out, and I had the content and so forth. And, um, you know, a couple of weeks leading up to the workshop, I had said to the, to the president who had, made, you know, hired me, brought, you know, made the decision to have me come in and do the training, I said to her, I said, hey, by the way, what is your plan to actually tra track the adoption of this? And she said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, how are you going to track whether people, people, you know, your team actually adopts the skills and the behaviors? And she said, well, well, we've got our metrics, you know, we've got, you know, face-to-face -face meetings, number of new job requirements, number of submittals, number of interviews. And I said, well, yeah, that's, that's great. You can continue to track that. But how, how does any of that tie into the content and what we're going to teach? You know, so, that, so the point was we got to take a look at the specific skills and behaviors that we're encouraging our people to, uh, to exemplify out on the floor. And then you've got to map out and think through how you're going to actually track and measure that. So for us, <clears throat> a couple ways that we do it within our training program, um, we actually record calls. So anybody, do you guys, anybody in here recording their, uh, the calls by, made by your account executives? That's fantastic. So that, that's awesome. Um, and then what do you do with those recordings? <laughs> well, hey, you're partway there. <laughs> you're partway there. So recording the calls is an amazing coaching tool. So you go back and you want to listen to it and you want to listen with your account executive on it and you can listen for certain things. So if you have a methodology, for example, in our methodology when we teach account executives how to go about making a cold call, one of the couple of core things that we teach is, you know, do they effectively disarm and put the person at ease? We also have a method of how we teach, you know, how you build, quickly build credibility with a, you know, with a buyer and there's certain language that you want to use. So we actually listen for these very specific keywords and we're able to track and measure that. Uh, so that's one simple example. Another example is we're big believers in creating call plans. So for every unique buyer you call on, a salesperson should have a call plan. So something really quick and easy to track and measure is, did you create a call plan? And it's a real simple template that you fill out. And so that's what's going to drive adoption of the skills and behaviors. Now the last piece, results. Of course we want to measure results, we want to measure placements revenue attainment, gross profit attainment, and so forth. But I would suggest that you actually focus on the three to the left because you can't manage to results. You know, I work with a lot of managers. I've come across a lot of managers over the years who, you know, say, well, we just manage to the number. I'm not so worried about activity. Well, that's nonsense. You can't manage the number because you don't have control over it. But what you can manage is you can manage knowledge transfer, application of skills, and adoption of behaviors because as a leader, we have the ability to influence that. And influencing that can ultimately influence the results. So there's a cause and effect relationship uh, between the two, or the three, if you will. Uh, all right, so let's talk for a minute about the, for, uh, the forgetting curve. Anybody ever heard that before? that term, the forgetting curve? 
So really important that we understand this and can appreciate this as leaders. So way back in the late 1800s, there was actually a uh, German psychologist by the name of Herben Ebbinghaus. And he did a study on memory and memory retention and inf ret uh, retention of information. And specifically, he wanted to look at what would happen when somebody was sort of exposed to a piece of information, but then made no effort at all to try to retain that information. And essentially, this is what came out of it. So think about this. I've got, you know, about a 40-minute time slot with you this morning uh, for this presentation. It's going to end. And from what this is saying, basically what this is saying is 20 minutes, 20 minutes when I'm done, 20 minutes after I walk out of here, you will have already forgotten 40% of what I've shared with you. If we stretch it out and we go out to tomorrow, you've already forgotten basically 70% of what I've shared with you. And so there's been a number of studies that have certainly come out since, and they all say more or less the same thing. One of the, the, the more popular ones is, and maybe you guys have heard this, you know, you put somebody through sales training, they're going to lose 80% of it after the first 30 days. So the point of all this and why I'm sharing this with you is, that's really dramatic. I mean, it's insane how dramatic it is. And so I think it was Lauren, she made a couple of really nice points up here, and I completely agree with what she was saying. She had mentioned one of the lessons she had learned in her office uh, was they were giving their employees or their new hires too much information too quick. And I think that's a brilliant observation on her behalf because one of the tendencies for managers, certainly I've been guilty of it more times than I care to admit, is we want to just shove information, water through a fire hose training, and we want to get our employees through training as quick as possible. The problem with that is it's information in one year and out the other. The problem for you that that presents is it's not only is it information in one year, but it's your money out the back door. So your employees are your most important asset, and you want to protect that investment. So we want to keep this in mind, have awareness of this, and think about what are we going to do after we put them through training, keeping this in mind, how are we going to drive adoption and sustain what we've learned. And in fact, it really starts today or tomorrow, because you guys have come here for this you know, two and a half or three day event. Think about all the great ideas that you're going to learn, the stories you're going to hear. So the question always is in, a, in, a, in an event, a workshop, a, a retreat like this, what are you going to do to hold yourself accountable to implementing these ideas and sustaining what you learn these three days? If I was to call all of you 30 days from now, a week from now, 30 days from now, 60 days from now, and ask you, hey, what ideas are you still adopting? Oh, Jesus, yeah, I know, I need to do that. So really important, because what you choose to adopt today from what you learned from today and yesterday and tomorrow means you're going to have to say no to something else. Okay. <clears throat> How many of us are familiar with the four stages of competency? I suspect most of you at some point have at least heard it. So <clears throat> stage one, we're unconsciously incompetent. So basically, we don't know what we don't know. And the reason why I decided to put this slide in is not so much to explain the four stages. I can touch on them real quickly. But <clears throat> it's really for you as leaders to have an awareness and an understanding of what's going through the mind of your employee when he or she is going through training and how they're consuming the content. So for somebody who's uh, unconsciously incompetent, they don't know what they don't know, they're scared, they're nervous, there's resistance, fear, uncertainty, doubt. So our job as the leader is we've got to manage to that. We've got to have an awareness of that. We've got to understand it's kind of like on the sales side, you know, and I know we've got some marketing folks here that talked about marketing. I don't know if they talked about understanding buyer personas, but if you understand how your buyers think, you can tailor and personalize your message accordingly. We've got to understand how our employees think, particularly our new hires, so that we can support them based on that. From there, they go to consciously incompetent. So now they're learning some things. They're understanding some new skills, some knowledge. But more importantly, they're now becoming aware of what they don't know. I actually vividly remember when I got into sales right out of college. Uh, I worked for a staffing company out of Chicago. And uh, so for my first, first year there, I worked, or year and a half there, I worked directly for the owner. It was a small company. And he was a great guy, but he wasn't a sales manager. The company was his toy, basically. He was, he was an investment banker, and that's what he had on the side. So I didn't really get much coaching for him. I just kind of figured everything out on my own. But he finally hired a sales manager who was in San Francisco, and I got to go out there for 
for a week and spend time with him. And it was fantastic how much I learned. But I remember asking him, his name was Doug. I said, I said, Doug, where am I? You know, I'm like a 23-year-old kid. I said, in the world of sales, if this is the book of sales and sales education, where exactly am I in that? And he's like, well, you're probably right here. You know, and I'm like, all right, well. And the point is, at that point, at least I was consciously incompetent, so I knew what I didn't know, and I knew I had a lot more to learn. I just didn't know how much more I had to learn. And so he was really great at coaching me up and kind of coaching me through this whole process. From there, you, get, you go to consciously competent, and then ultimately unconsciously competent. So unconsciously competent, basically that means when your account executive is on the phone with a candidate or a customer and they say, you know, something like, hey, I've got other candidates just as good at $5 less, your, can your uh, account executive, either they execute in that conversation or they get stuck, duh, duh, uh, uh, then they sputter and then what happens? That conversation goes downhill. So either they, they can execute it and they don't even have to think about it. And that's what, I, that's what I'm referring to, or that's what I think of when I talk about unconsciously competent. I like to refer to that as conversation ready. So are your sales reps or are your account executives conversation ready? Can they actually execute? And again, the big challenge that we see in working with organizations, back to the focus on the launch of a training, their whole focus is, oh, well, if I can get them through training you know, on such and such date and have them complete on such and such date, we'll start to see results quicker.